So the main okay. thing we really wanted to talk about on this show was to get your take on what I've been discussing in some of my videos of late, which have become known as the God videos. Got to call them something, right? Mm -hmm. This is me questioning theology, uh, questioning the true nature of this place, what we are, why we're here, and what the creator is, the true nature of the creator and his or its motives. Uh, so I'm not an atheist. I did go through a period in my life where I was, but quite clearly there is some kind of creative generative force because here we are, something created this, right? But I've got questions about its nature and whether we can assume that it's benevolent and wants the best for us, which is what we prefer to assume. But I think you've probably seen a couple of my videos and, uh, I'm really just asking questions. I'm not claiming to have any of the answers, but I do have some big questions. So sure. uh, would you care to weigh in on that? I don't know if there's anywhere you'd particularly like to start. Absolutely. Well, um, I'll, I'll start with uh, saying where, where I am. I was an atheist for 40 years. So from the age of 13, I, I sort of did a bit of research on all the, all the different religions and uh, concluded they were control systems and I didn't want anything to do with them. So I've never had any um, exposure to any, any religions other than that. Um, I never went to, to church or Sunday school, um, nothing at all. Um, in this journey that I've been over the last 20 years, finding the truth, it led me to the creator and uh you know, a few years back, several years back, I decided to read the Old Testament, read the Bible, um, you know, for the first time ever. Um, I read the whole thing through three times and realized a few things. And the first thing I realized was that the New Testament doesn't fit. The New Testament is a completely different story. And, uh, you know, to, in order to believe it, you have to essentially dump the whole of the Old Testament. Mm. But, you know, my, my intuition was that the Old Testament was, was, was real and right. And the New Testament just did not fit. So part of your struggle, um, as, as I saw it um, listening to you, is that the tenets of, um, of Christianity and, uh, you know, what's said in the New Testament you know, I'll just don't don't make sense. They just simply don't make sense. Yeah, I would and agree. don't fit what we see around us. I decided on um, as a result of uh, you know reading it through three times to research the Old Testament, um, not just uh, you know read it over and over and over again, but you know try and follow where where the people in the Old Testament went after after the book ends. And, uh, you know, what, what the story is, look at the, uh, other, um, look at the other books that were taken out. Um, and why were they taken out? Who took them out? Um, also, you know, the, the motivations of the people behind, you know, behind these, the, the, uh, uh, the new Testament and, uh, you know, behind the story. Um, also look at the language, the language it was written in, because, that gives you a big clue to, to how this, uh, you know, how the deception behind, you know, religion works. So um, that's it. I started researching it. And as a result, I found a, a story that you can understand. It's easily understandable. And um, it's a story that hasn't finished yet. We're still, we're still in, the, in the, well, not the midst, but uh, at the end of that story. First of all, you've got to get, you know, dump everything that you've learned in Christianity, because if you try and view it through that lens, you can't, you won't ever get the story. So um, essentially, this, uh, this place was created. Um, it wasn't, you know, well, our civilization now wasn't the first one. Um, the book actually tells you that there were previous civilizations but the Most High just wiped it clean because it, it got so wicked that uh, he literally wiped it clean and started again. And uh, the Old Testament um, is only concerned with the last 7,000 years of, of Earth's history. So the, I think we're up to the 6,000-year mark now. What basically the story is, 
is that uh, the Most High created Adam as the uh, the new governor of Earth. As I said, there were previous civilizations, and that civilization um, apparently was ruled by an angel. Right, so there was an angel that was a govern governor of Earth, and when the Most High created Adam as the new governor, right, he um, the Most High told the angels to worship Adam as they would worship him. And the previous governor, uh, he didn't want to. He said, I was here first. I'm more powerful than this, this mud man you've created. Um, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to worship him. And um, convinced a few other angels to, to follow him. So the first um, attack on Adam Adam was meant to be immortal. Um, that's in one of the books that was taken out. So he was meant to be the immortal governor of Earth. So the first attack was what we call the uh, the story of the apple in the garden, um, which wasn't about eating apples at all. It was an angel called Gadriel or Gad um, who had sex with Eve because uh, Adam and Eve weren't meant to have sex. They were going to be the immortal governors. So um, he had sex with Eve. Um, Eve showed Adam, and uh, with that, with that sort of uh, with sexual intercourse, they essentially lost their Im immortality. You know, there's a there's a release of energy when you have an orgasm, and uh, and I believe that's the uh, that was a, the reason they lost their immortality. So essentially, Plan B was it was going to be the offspring of Adam that was going to be the, the governors of Earth. So the second attack was in Genesis 6-4, where the um, angels um, came down, 200 of them, and, uh, and started having sex with women and produced their own bloodline, um, which virtually corrupted virtually everybody on, on Earth. Um, so that the earth again turned turned utterly wicked, and um, the Most High had to basically wipe it clean. There was only one man, as we all know, the one man who wasn't corrupted, and that was Noah. And um, it turns out that Noah's wife was corrupted. It turns out she was from the line of Cain, so Noah's children were were somewhat corrupted. And uh, a week before the flood, Noah had to find wives for his three sons. So um, the, the only women that were available were corrupted ones. So the Nephilim DNA got the other side of, of the flood through the DNA of, his, of, of Noah's children. So, um, so post-flood, what was happening was uh, the Most High was sifting the bloodlines, right, trying to get back to the original blueprint of adam so you know that's why there was such a, um, a, a emphasis on who begat who begat who um well yeah but, bloodlines uh, bloodlines have always been important and still are in terms of those yes. that get elevated to prominent uh, statuses but how can we know right. that adam and noah were real characters historical characters rather than metaphors like composite metaphors for humanity generally how can sure. we know they were real well here's one thing um noah's ark was found um in 1960 i believe um so there was a um, a turkish army captain um he came across a boat-shaped object, um, you know, a formation in the ground. Um, Mount sort of Ararat, the right? Foothills of Mount Ararat, right? Mm. Um, and the Americans sent an archaeological team, and they immediately debunked it. They said it's a natural formation, right? okay? Um, but there was, a, there was a guy called Ron Wyatt who um, was interested in the story, and he went over himself, and he took... Um, metal detectors, ground penetrating radar, and a few other um, you know toys, um, and you know went to look for it. Um, there's a you know there's a bit of a synchronicity involved, right? That shows that he was led to go and see it, but he he managed to get to the site and found that uh, with the metal detectors he found lines of metal rivets that were describing the superstructure of a boat. 
Now, this is 70 miles away from the nearest body of water. Okay. Um, he wanted to excavate um, to, to actually, you know, uncover the, this boat. Um, and the Turkish government refused. So they were sort of humming and ahhing and they, they wouldn't let him excavate. And at that very moment, <laughs> there was an earthquake at that very spot that did the excavation for him. <laughs> so that earthquake um, uncovered all these, um, these formations that were petrified wood that showed the, the entire superstructure of a boat, which is exactly the um, measurements that were given to, to Noah um, in, in Genesis. The only, um, the only thing that was wrong with the, uh, you know, with the location of the boat was that it was in the foothills and the book tells you that uh, it, it came to rest in the mountains. So they actually went up to the mountains and that's where they found the, uh, the actual keel of the ark still embedded in the mountainside. Um, and the final, the final you know, uh, key to the story is that Ararat, Ararat is uh, volcanic. So at some point in the 4,000 years or so, um, since the ark landed there, um, uh, Ararat erupted and covered the ark in, uh, in you know, lava. And it covered it so quickly that uh, you know, the wood wasn't allowed to burn. So essentially the uh, the weight of the lava and and the, the weight of the ark snapped it off its keel and it went down the mountainside in you know in the lava flow and you can if you go on google earth and look at that very spot you'll see the lava flow which is darker is darker than the uh, surrounding countryside okay. so literally that's the ark so it tells you that that actually happened so you feel the New Testament is largely propaganda, like political propaganda that was tacked on to the Old Testament, whereas you're more yes. inclined to, to think the Old Testament is the real deal. But mm -hmm. as you've said, there have been books taken out and it's been translated and passed around who knows how many times. So how can we be sure that it's still accurate and there's still validity to it? Well, here's the wonderful thing about the language that uh, the, uh, the Hebrew scriptures, you know, not the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures were written in. Um, it's a pictorial language, and it's, it's, an, it's an amazing language, and I've done a whole video about it called The Language of Creation. Um, it's a pictographic language that creates word pictures. So every letter is a word picture. Every word is a word picture. Every sentence is a word picture. Every book is a word picture. So, yes, you can try and translate it and, uh, and try and move the meaning uh, around, but the word picture remains the same. You can't hide it. And uh, if you, if you uh, really want to, to, to get a real sense of what the, the book is saying, whenever you find um, a verse that doesn't seem to make sense in the Old Testament, right, Find lots of different um, versions, um, and I would say old versions, old translations, not the new ones, because the new ones are just there to uh, um, use the modern word magic to, to move the, the story away. If you go back to the old, um, old translations, what you do, what you find is um, for a particular word, you'll get one translator that will translate it one way, another translator will translate it another um, because every Hebrew word has eight different meanings. And what you do in English is when you see a word with several different meanings, you choose the one you like. You choose the one that you think fits. But in Paleo-Hebrew, you take all the words together and see what you know, it feels like to you. You know, the, the, the whole combination of the set of meanings. This is where so, in your live talks you give the example of the films. Uh, you know, yes. the film that you can make from the pictures offered. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I was seeing that that, that is, a, you know, the original language of mankind still trying to push its way through our, uh, um, through our subconscious. Yeah, but, so that's the way we think, through pictures, not words. So, yeah, by, by grabbing all these different meanings from different uh, translator, 
texts, translators, you can you can actually look at all those meanings they present to you and get the real sense of what's what's really being being said there. And when you do that, you realize ah, there is no there is no uh, confusion here. Uh, it makes sense now. Um, some, so that's some, how you know. Yeah, some people feel that with the new with the old and new testaments, we're getting an insight into two gods, and many feel that with the old testament it's actually satan and that you get the real god presenting himself in the new testament and uh you know this goes into the idea that god and satan can be the same thing getting into duality but if we assume that the god of the old testament is the most high and the original creator it doesn't really feel like great news for humanity because this god is psychopathic jealous angry murderous lustful uh you know desires the blood of infants genocides entire groups you know if, if this is the god we have then it doesn't fill me full of confidence well it depends on who you think is humanity because on, on what sorry you know, we, it depends on who you think of as humanity well, because you have man here and you have mankind here. I'm talking about the, the, the men, women and children of the world, basically. Right. But I'm saying to you, you don't just have the race of man here. You have um, the race of man and mankind. Right. Something like man, but not man. Right. That's. That was a story of the uh, fallen angels having having sex with women and creating their own bloodline that isn't quite human, and they're still here today. Okay. Um, now, have you seen the film Aliens? Yes. So, imagine that you come across a, a, a village, and it is full of those aliens. And you, you know, you look at, you find a cave, and there's all those eggs that just sit in there waiting for people. Yeah, <laughs> right. Would you hesitate about killing every alien, every female and female alien, and every egg? Would you? Would you worry about that? If you felt they were a threat to you and they were going to do you harm, then well, you've no. seen a film. Are they a threat? <laughs> in the film, they are. Yeah. Right. So what what happened was. There was an alien invasion thousands of years ago right, by this, this invasive species called the Nephilim. Right? And not they, most of them or some of them didn't look even human. And as, um, in the Old Testament, it tells you that some of them were called uh, the terrors. They, looked, they, they barely looked human. Right? But they were bloodthirsty, man-eating and, uh, and utterly wicked. Right? And the Most High said when he, you know, you'll find that most of the time you talk about um, going in and destroying everybody. Right? He's talking about um, the Canaanites. Right. So let me step back and tell you who the Canaanites were. OK, so I mentioned that um, that uh, Noah's wife right, was uh, was corrupted. Right? If you um, if you do a bit of digging, you find that Noah's wife was somebody called Naama. Right? And she was of the line of Cain. She wasn't completely wicked, but she had she still had the uh, bloodline of the line of Cain. And Cain came out of the union of Gad and Eve. Right, so so that was he was like the forerunner of the Nephilim. So um, she was corrupted, and uh, Noah's sons were, were were corrupted as well. Right, because of because of that. Now there's a story um, early on in um, in Genesis where just after the flood, Noah you know gets drunk, and uh, and his son Ham um, goes in and apparently sees him naked, and then uh, and then there's a, a curse, right? Well, when you examine that, you'll find that this phrase to to uncover your father's nakedness. It's it actually means to sleep with uh, with, with the you know father's wife, okay. You'll find that um, echoed in Leviticus, okay. So what happened was that Ham went and slept with uh, with his mother Naama, 
Now, again, Nama was of the line of Cain, who were, were sort of performing all wicked deeds anyway. So, you know, she wasn't innocent in, in that, I don't think. So, um, so Ham wasn't cursed because of that. It was Canaan, his son, who was the, who was the uh, offspring of um, Naama and Ham. OK, because uh, the Old Testament goes to great lengths to say, right, and Canaan, who is the son of Ham, <laughs> right, and not the son of uh, Noah, because it was with Noah's wife. Right. So um, so here's the thing. It's a, it represents a concentration of Nephilim DNA because Ham was uh, already, you know, compromised. Naama was compromised. Right? And uh, and and literally this this direct um, direct uh, incest right was concentrated this Nephilim DNA such that all the the post flood Nephilim were Canaanites children of Canaan right so um, again uh, all this destruction you know said to kill all these uh, you know every everyone out of a village it was the Canaanites. Who were who were you know who were totally corrupted, and it seems like uh, if you look in the book of Jasher, the Canaanites were actively um, promoting you know the the Nephilim uh, traits in their society because they they you know in again the book of Jasher it tells you that um, when Jacob's children went against uh, the seven, was it seven or nine um, Canaanite nations? Each one of those nations had a whole set of what they called mighty men or giants that they were used to, to try and fight the, uh, the, the Israelites. So it looks like they were actively trying to, to create these mighty men, right, to, and promote this Nephilim DNA. So, so you're saying, so yeah. Hmm? You're saying that when. God or the Most High is genociding all these groups. It's not people as we understand it. It's Canaanites. Why is this not made clearer then in the Old Testament? If this is a book that's been sent to guide us and, and you know, give us wisdom and knowledge, why is it so difficult to intuit this? Because you have to really decode what it's saying to get to this kind of information, because what's implied on the surface is that this God is a psychopath and he enjoys murdering people and demanding the sacrifice of firstborn infants and this kind of thing. That's what you take away from it when you read it on the surface. So why was it not made clearer and more direct if it was intended to enrich mankind's knowledge? Because um, you you discount the active influence of the Nephilim bloodlines, so the Nephilim bloodlines, well, um, they were, um, and, and this is where the the actual battle comes in, right? Remember, I said that uh, the Most High post flood was sifting the bloodlines so that he could get back to the original bloodline of Adam, right? So what happened was that, uh, you know, he, he he chose a very particular line of people and he was sort of uh, nudging the people in that bloodline to to marry certain people. So um, it went through a, a set of chosen ones. So Abraham was a chosen one and he was told to marry his half-sister, again, to keep the bloodline, you know, clean as such. Um, and then... Um, uh, uh, I, th I think yeah. Before before um, Sarah, his his wife, half sister, um, before she conceived, my like Sarah gave a, um, a, an Egyptian handmaid for him to to uh, you know have a, a child with. But he wasn't he wasn't chosen because um, he wasn't right bloodline. So um, Isaac was the chosen one because he was the bloodline of of uh, Abraham and Sarah. Um, and when it came down to his children, something new happened. So um, the firstborn, all the fallen angel DNA was concentrated in the firstborn, Esau. And um, in Jacob, um, there was none of the uh, fallen angel DNA. So now Jacob's line was now considered clean. It was back to the original bloodline of Adam. Okay. So that, but that set up this this uh, um, rivalry, 
It's more than a rivalry. It's a hatred between the representatives of the fallen angels and the uh, children of the Most High. And that's the that's the battle that's been going on ever since that ever since that time. Now, those Edomites, as they're called, they became the Greeks and the Romans. And that's why certain books were taken out, because the book of Jasher, for instance, tells you that uh, that they became the Greeks. Um, and then um, I'm sorry, the Romans. It tells you they became Romans. Um, some of the books of the Apocrypha. Uh, especially the rest of Esther, uh, tells you that they became Greeks as well. So it was, you know, these Edomites, the enemies of the uh, the Israelites, who decided what books were to be taken out and what uh, verses were to be taken out and, uh, and what to add into it, which is uh, the New Testament. Now, um, You know, if you try and, as I said to you earlier, if you try and look at the story through the lens of the New Testament, you won't get it. And, uh, you know, they they, I don't know if this was an accident or or something, but they left in Genesis 6, 4, that one line that says that the Nephilim, right, there there were Nephilim on the earth and they came about through the union of angels and uh, and, and human women. If they... I, th- I can only imagine that they they missed that one, and uh, you know if they'd left that out, we wouldn't know that we wouldn't have known about it. But uh, they also took out the Book of Enoch, which the Book of Enoch gives you you know total detail about um, that event. Where you've got one line in the Old Testament, you've got books and books of what happened, you know, with these fallen angels. Right. So I mean, God God just seems bipolar, to be honest, between. The old and new testament he's got a completely God different in, personality the most high isn't in the new testament he's not in there at all he never speaks in the in the new testament so what about uh, the figure of jesus are you, are you saying that jesus was a historical figure or do you think that's astro theology or what's your view on jesus he was made up he was made up right um right. when you when you again when you research it You'll find things like uh, the Codex Sinaiticus. The Codex Sinaiticus is the first version of the New Testament, right? And it, you know, there's there's whole loads of stuff that's missed out, and uh, there's no allusion to you know this this character being the the Son of the Most High or ascending into heaven afterwards. Yeah, <laughs> there's nothing of that. So it was added in later, right? The the New Testament was a, a fraudulent work right, designed to do certain things. Right? Now, if you've got to remember that the whole of the Old Testament is about and for the Israelites. Nobody else, just the Israelites. Okay? Um, so the New Testament is about keeping the Israelites under control um, so they could be exterminated. So... Um, in Bloody the, hell, I thought uh, I pissed the, off Christians, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> no, you have no idea. You have no idea. The, the whole, the whole of the uh, the Inquisitions is about um, trying to convert the uh, the Israelites to to JC. That's 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 what that was all for. You know, you were told about uh, it was pagans. No, it was the Israelites. That's who they were, they were targeting. Um, and then when they couldn't do it, they, they actually ended up taking all the children and uh, raising them as Christians. So they didn't know any better. Um, so, yes, it's uh, um, we've been in a war. There's been a war raging for thousands of years. And, uh, you know, most people don't know it's, it's been happening. So and where does that combination. where does that leave us now? I mean, what relevance does this have for us today? Uh, where, where are we the relevance, now? The relevance is that uh, right now we're in a, pl- a time called the con- confusion of face. So, you know, people, um, you know, hearing this will we'll hear, we'll hear race. They'll go, oh, it's racism. Um, I'm talking about black people and, and white people not being whatever. You can't look at somebody and know who they are because one of the uh, weapons of war of this bloodline is rape. Right? It's literally... Um, They'll infiltrate a population, and this is how they wage war. They will inf- infiltrate a population in a few at a time and uh, uh, eventually take 
um, positions of power. And once they've got enough power, they will um, kill all the men, rape all the women, and rename themselves as the original population. And, uh, and then change history so you don't know about the original population. So that process is still happening today. All right. So, you know, two, what, 300 years ago, an Australian was a, was a very black man. Now an Australian is a white European. Right? Same with America. America was, uh, were, was, was a copper colored man. And now he's a white European. Um, and so that, that's the people were called, um, you know, this bloodline, they were called the name stealers. <laughs> that, was, that was what they were known as. Yeah, um, and and what they would do is, uh, they if if a traveler trying to go to China to to trade would go through their lands, they would invite this stranger in and you know give them a nice meal and sit down, give them give them lots of drink and uh, have a nice time with them, right? Find out everything they can find out about them, and then kill them and then go to make the deal themselves, right? So um, they were known as imposters and name stealers and that's that's who this bloodline are today so you've got a lot of people um walking around um especially in the uk who look white but they're actually black people francis had a son called isaac isaac had a son called enoch enoch had a son called edward edward had a son called norman and norman had a son called cedric and that's me and it's as direct as that. That's my family tree on my father's side going back 250 years. Historians sometimes say that there's a mystery about the disappearance of the black Georgian population, that we know numbered thousands. Mm. But really the answer to that mystery is you. Yes, we're going around in disguise, in camouflage, walking about the place, and many people don't know. But I'm glad that I know. I'm proud of that because they're mine and because it's my history and I, and I feel sorry for people who don't know. The whole of the, the Irish population, for instance, um, they were originally black people. The, they were the Israelites. Ireland, you know, in Paleo-Hebrew means land of the Hebrews. Yeah. Um, Britain or Britannia means land of the covenant. So a British man, again, that's another Paleo-Hebrew word, two words, Briat and Aish, uh, which means covenant man, the covenant between Abraham and the Most High. So um, the Irish were black people. And um, when Oliver Cromwell took over, his job was to exterminate the Irish. So he literally went in and killed as many Irish men as he could. And those he didn't kill, they transported to their new colonies in the Caribbean. Now, um, he essentially did his job because um, Ireland's population went down by um, 40%. Essentially, all the men, gone. So how does a population of black women you know, continue? Well, what happened was um, Oliver Cromwell couldn't pay his men, his soldiers. So he gave his soldiers um, lands in Ireland. And those lands came with titles. And so the, uh, the new landowners would rape the women. Um, the darker skinned offspring would get transported. The lighter skinned ones got to stay. You do that for 300 years and you end up with uh, um, this white population of German descendants, right? Who, as it happens, didn't achieve white status until 1940. And uh, even when they achieved white status in, in Britain, um, the Irish still had the stigma, and it's called the one drop rule, you know, one drop of Negro blood makes you a Negro. They still had the stigma of having that one drop of Negro blood because uh, when you know, my parents came over from the Caribbean, they saw signs that said, you know, no blacks, no dogs, no Irish because they, the Irish still had the stigma. I hope that makes sense. Breeding out genetics over several generations by design. Yes. It only takes three generations to get rid of the colour. And, you know, you can watch a film called uh, Rabbit Proof Fence, where they literally lay it out 
um, you know, with respect to Australia, as it happens, but they lay out the process. Notice, if you will, the half-caste child, and there are ever-increasing numbers of them. Now, what is to happen to them? Are we to allow the creation of an unwanted third race? Should the coloreds be encouraged to go back to the black? Or should they be advanced to white status and be absorbed in the white population? Now, time and again, I am asked by some white man, if I marry this colored person, will our children be black? And as chief protector of Aborigines, it is my responsibility to accept or reject those marriages. Here is the answer. Three generations. Half-blood grandmother, quadroon daughter, octroon grandson. Now, as you can see, in the third generation, or third cross, no trace of native origin is apparent. The continuing infiltration of white blood finally stamps out the black color. The Aboriginal has simply been bred out. Yeah, sorry, you, you mm -hmm. claim that British royals in the past were black. Yes, they were. Um, in fact, Charles II was essentially the last black um, black king. Um, so it's quite funny that now we've got Charles III. Um, but Charles II was the last black king of this country. Um, is memorialised because his nickname was the Black Boy because he was so dark as a child. They called him the Black Boy. And that's why you've got the Black Boy Inn and Black Boy Lane and all that, these, uh, you know, places named after him, you know, in honour of King Charles II. Yeah. Um, Did he have sausage fingers as well? <laughs> no, he was uh, apparently a, a, a very tall, handsome, dashing figure as well. Um, no, not like this one. There's a, no, I'm totally unlike this one because what you've got on the throne now is a Germanic bloodline. Um so they're not they're not the real bloodline. They're Germans who usurp the throne, yeah. um, and that's why they took the name Windsor, so they wouldn't be they wouldn't be seen as Germans anymore. Yeah. Um, so they're the Saxe Coburg Gotha Battenberg family. Yeah. Um, so so no, they they married into that bloodline, married into the real royalty, but they're not actually the bloodline. Yeah. So with these videos I've been doing recently, there's a couple of big questions. And I think I'm going to ask these of every guest that comes on for a conversation okay. of this nature to get their take on it, because these are questions that I'm grappling with and uh, they're, they're, they're very, very big. Uh, the first one is why nature is so brutal. Thinking about the animal kingdom, the food chain, the fact that creatures need to murder other creatures in the billions every single day just to get food to survive it's horrific it's brutal it's a bloodbath why would any loving benevolent creator want a situation with that much pain and suffering and fear and death well do you know that um <clears throat> within your body there are cells that uh, that consume other cells there's there's loads of them there's uh, millions and you know billions of cells get consumed by other cells every single day Right. Did, were you aware of that? Uh, no, I wasn't. Oh, well, there are. There's, there's a whole, there's a whole ecosystem right, um, operating in your body where you know, you know, where certain cells are produced, uh, they're overproduced, then other cells will, um, appear to to take those numbers down, right? So that you your body stays in the equilibrium. Well, the same thing is happening here. The animals out here aren't just there for show. Their job is to keep this world running and ticking over perfectly. That's their job. Okay. The lion isn't eating antelopes because it likes antelope meat. Obviously, it probably does, but it's not doing it because it likes antelope meat. It's because the antelope are there doing a job. They're there keeping the savannah, you know, nice and, you know, uh, mowed and, uh, and, and taken care of. Right. If the antelope population grows too much, they start destroying the savanna. So the lion population grows to keep down the, the, um, the antelope population. 
And the what lion the lions gets a better do, deal out of it than the antelope. The lions, what they do is they pick off the weak, the old, and the slow. So they keep the antelope herd perfect you know perfectly um able to do their job and the whole of the animal kingdom is doing that it's a they're doing jobs we are the only um, animal that doesn't have a job because our job is to experience this place right? all the animals are there keeping this terranium working perfectly but it's all suffering and fear and death and again, why would a loving God want suffering, fear, and death? Because again, you know, the, you, the antelope is suffering it, when it gets pulled apart by the lion. You know what? How how is that? If you look at thing? it in that way, if you're looking at it that way, then look at the cells in your body because the same thing happens in your body. Cells which are conscious living beings, right? They're 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 being consumed by other cells to keep the body working. So how is yeah, that a good thing? What, you know, what, why could a benevolent God not have created a system where none of that was necessary? It's a system of balance. <laughs> it's it's you're you're looking at it from a from a human perspective, right? And uh, and and not a a system perspective. It's the only way a system can can operate. A system of life can operate. Yeah, we we were talking earlier about your bid to be leader of the uk leader of britain mm -hmm. if i were god if i were the leader of everything i would create a system that didn't involve cells eating other cells and animals eating other animals because i can think of better ways that it could all run yes but here, here, here here's the thing right a moment ago you didn't consider your cells as as um, living beings eating other living beings you didn't consider that because you didn't know that Right, because the yeah, there's no. But you knew that's there. what was happening. You knew there was consciousness there. Everything in your body is conscious. Everything. All right. right? Well, in fact, I, I'm I'm not conscious of that process taking place within my body. There's no evidence to me of it happening. But it is. You know, if you if you if you get a uh, an infection, you get um, white blood cells that come up to start eating, right? <laughs> to start consuming. The uh, you know the, the products of that infection, right? Which again, all everything in your body is alive. <laughs> as soon as it's dead, it's not part of your body anymore. So okay, so so why couldn't we have had a human? Why couldn't we have had a human body that didn't involve the replication of cells that where it just wasn't necessary? Well, again, again, a moment ago, you didn't see that as a process of oh something's killing something else no you saw it as a process of keeping a system in equilibrium right well you i just, just accepted that just it's in... taking place i accepted that it happens right. it doesn't but, mean i but, approve of it i know but a mo again a moment ago you didn't know that, that that's what was going on right the same thing is happening out here in the world. It isn't a, a, a case of, oh, it's all suffering and death and destruction. No, it's a process of equilibrium. Yeah. If if humans disappeared off this earth, right, um, then what would happen is all the animals will continue doing this, you know, this process to keep the earth and actually restoring the earth to, to, to perfect equilibrium. That's what their job is. Well, an antelope might disagree. An antelope doesn't have level of consciousness to disagree. It has a capacity to feel pain and fear, though. Indeed. So, you know, so are your cells. Your cells, you know, it, to the same degree, as I said, right, um, would, would in your, you know, in your view, feel, have the capacity to feel because they're conscious. But they don't have the same capacity as you, as you see it as a human they are doing a job okay well i can just see ways that it could all have been done differently and avoid okay. suffering show me one i don't have the blueprints to hand right now but right but it, it, yeah but if i was god if i was omniscient all seeing all knowing all powerful then yeah for sure i could come up with a better way of doing things that didn't involve billions why, of why do you it. think it's a why do you think you could come up with the best way than the most high can well if i were the most high then i'd be capable of anything wouldn't i but you're saying then that you um you can do something better than the most high 
I think no, not not in my current not in my confused. current human form. I'm saying if I were the Most High. No, but you're you're saying that you know your mentality is is somehow superior to the Most High. That you could come up with a better system. If I were all seeing, all knowing, and all powerful, yes, because anything is possible. Which is you saying you are you are superior to the Most High. No, it's not me saying that. It's saying it is saying, because the Most High came saying, up with this system. The most I okay. came up with this well, system. Then, well, then, right? Okay, so, which so we're back I to. Say, I see, from my perspective, as a perfect system. Right? It, you know, if if we disappeared, right, the earth would restore itself because, it, like a terranium, right, if you get a terranium and uh, you leave it alone, it will it will thrive because all the little creatures in there will be doing their jobs and if they if some you know there's some of the creatures are there to keep the others in check and it's it's all uh, an interconnected web that keeps the whole system of life running right and you're just uh, you're just imposing your um, feelings of disgust or 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 um, um justice or whatever it is onto a, a perfectly working system and also saying that you could do better well i'm I'm not alone judging by many of the comments i've had as well uh okay we're, we're back to one of my original uh, theological questions which is questioning mm -hmm. the nature of whatever created this you know call it the most high if it were truly benevolent and loving i just can't see mm -hmm. why this way of doing things would be necessary so so that's what makes well, me question uh, the motives again, of life of the creator Life has to has to be um, sort of uh, structured in terms of life. Yeah, it can't it couldn't be sort of um, you, your your situation or your uh, solution would uh, sounds like it would be like you know you'd, you'd create uh, robots out of sand that will do all the things for, you know instead of all the uh, you know the the process of of animals keeping themselves in equilibrium you'd come up with some some silicon based si system. well no how about animals right? how about animals eating uh you know plants how about animals eating prana air even you know rather than the the bodies and the flesh of other animals that just want to be left alone and survive that's why they well, run again, away when I they're hunted if, personally Personally, I think that we don't need to be eating animals or anything, actually, because I did the breatharian experiment uh, that showed me that uh, we're not, we don't necessarily have to, to actually eat. But we are a special case. Our job is to experience this place. All the other animals are here to keep this system in equilibrium, equilibrium which is why there's, uh, there is no such thing as, um, as uh, evolution. Because in order for this system to, to, to come into being, everything else had to be in place so that the system would work. So everything had to come into place at the same time. Otherwise, it wouldn't have worked because it, the, whole of, uh, the, the, um, you know, the whole of nature is interdependent, interdependent on everything else. Okay. Well, yeah, I certainly don't accept evolution. Yeah, nor do I, but... But the, you know, the point is that, you know, everything has a job to do and, uh, you know, to stop them over proliferating, there has to be um, a control mechanism over that. And then there has to be a control mechanism over that and so on and so on. So it's interlocking and um, it will, it will um, manage itself. And again, it's a perfect system and it's a system that's replicated inside your body. All right. So how about we move on to my second big question, which th there's okay. a phrase which came up in the comments of mm -hmm. my previous videos, which goes, no good deed goes unpunished. And it's the observation that there seems to be a direct correlation, which is testable between the amount of good work you try and put into the world, the amount of help you try and give to others, uh, like you're trying to do with your campaign, and the amount of suffering you seem to reap as a result. And like I say, people can try this for themselves. I know a lot of people who are trying to do their best, trying to help others, trying to put good work into the world. And all they seem to reap in return for their efforts is a world of shit in, in various forms. So what's that all about? Because you would think that if we have a loving, benevolent God, if you try and do good work in line with God's will or, you know, helping others, 
then you'd benefit from that rather than be made to suffer. What do you think about that one? Right. Well, um, I don't know about you know your experience, but my experience isn't that. I've I've literally been helping people um, for the last what ten years now, no, eleven years now, right? And uh, put my put all of my faith in in the Most High to look after me. Yeah, <laughs> and um, over the last um, you know eleven years, I've had a great time. I've not had all the all lots of crap happen to me. Yeah. Um, now I'm I'm actually I'm actually uh, putting together or I have put together a, a new talk um, called Becoming Neo, and uh, it's literally about how this how this uh, reality functions and how we function in this reality. Um, and the truth about this matter is that we have essentially ultimate power over this reality right um using our thoughts and our uh, imagination and, and things like that right? we have control over it and you know i'm again no disrespect to you mark right but if you if you stare into evil long enough evil stares back at you right um and you know you are you're, you're focused on on the all that dark stuff uh, that's your focus yeah, but it's, it's, it's not that. It's not that I look at conspiracy stuff and dark information and stuff and that's affecting me. I'm talking about other things that are happening in my life. I'm not going to go into it because it's personal. But, you know, it's it's like my, my personal life circumstances. And I've got many, many friends who are also suffering in similar ways. And they're basically decent people trying to do the right thing. So I, I don't think it's a reflection of I'm not in a dark energetic state because of the information I look into. It's just shit that's happening to me in my life. And you know. What I'm trying to say is that, you know, we are we have been um, brainwashed, propagandized and poisoned into not realizing our true power. And so um, we we're, we're like we're like a child with a gun. <laughs> right? um, you know, we, if you're not trained, you don't know how what it is and how to use it. You're going to do lots of damage and that, most of that damage is going to be to yourself. Right. Um, and that's all of us. We've all been through this system that has hidden, um, you know, the, our power, um, which is how to how to um, change and manipulate the world around us, so so that we can have the experience that we want. Right? Um, in my talk, I, I, I show the barriers that stop you from from you know changing the world in your favour. And there are loads of them. There's loads of barriers right, that were put there by this system, by the social engineering. Right. So um, I would hazard a guess that most of the people who experience this don't know that they're getting in their own way. And I'm, yeah, I'm, again, no disrespect to you or anybody else. Right. But this is the way the system has been been structured, because I believe that the Nephilim do not have the ability that we have. So they are harnessing our abilities right, um, to, to have the effects um, that they want to have in this world. I do get what you're saying, and I've, I've come across this dynamic before, and I feel there's relevance to it. But it can apply when you're working on your own circumstances with your own free will. But when there are others involved, other people involved, you obviously can't hijack, hijack their free will and cause them to behave in certain ways. And and so if other people and their behaviours are causing the problems in your world, then there's not much you can do about that because you can only change yourself. No. Well, no, you can. You change yourself because you are drawing those people into your world. That, that, it's as simple as that. I'm well, they can be your family them. members where you don't really have a choice. It, it, indeed, but you draw the, the circumstances into your world. Right. Um, there's no other. There's no other way of putting it. You. This is what I'm finding out. We are. We are very, very powerful beings, but we don't know we've got this power. Right. And and again, child with a gun. You know, we're we're waving the thing about because we think it's a stick, <laughs> and uh, and people are getting hurt because of it. Yeah. And again, mostly ourselves. Right? And we're like we're shooting ourselves in the foot and going what. what what happened? Why am I? Why am I bleeding? You know, 
because we're wielding this power without knowing it. The, the controllers know how to wield that power for us and they're doing it and they're doing it in uh, very clever. They're doing it in, in clever ways um, so that we don't know what, it, what we're doing, but they're using our power to, to manipulate the world around us. Okay. Um, I don't, I don't, I don't know any other way to, to say it. It's, it. It sounds rather upsetting because, you know, what, how it's, it definitely it can't be me that's doing it, but I'm sorry, it is. And, you know, we're all, we're all subject to it. Right. We, we all bring in and, and I'm, if you see some of my videos um you know, especially the, the latest ones, um, you'll see I've, I've, I've gone down a progression of realizing this, this truth that, um, we are literally drawing in um, all, all the things that um, all the negative things in our lives, right? um, and because we don't understand how we how you know we we affect the world. Um, an example is if you if you're against war, if you're against war, and you start um, campaigning, stop the war, stop the war, right? Then what you're what you're telling your subconscious or the subconscious. What you're telling you is that you want war. You want more war. You want strife. You want that's because the, the, your sub or the subconscious doesn't understand English. It doesn't understand German or French. It understands focus and intent. So even though you're saying stop the war, I don't want war, you're focusing on war. So that's what you're going to draw into yourself. Well, I can relate that to, uh, you, you know, some nights where you might not have slept for three nights and you're knackered and you go to bed and you think, oh, I've got to sleep tonight. I really hope I sleep tonight. And what happens is you don't sleep that night. So it seems similar messages are being sent. Because you're focusing on sleeplessness. But, yeah, but but that to me seems like a flawed system as well. What, what's the use it's, of a subconscious that doesn't comprehend what you're trying to say to it? That That's just flawed. That's not working system. in your favour. It's a perfect new again. You're you're focused um, temporally. You're focused on on right and here and right now, right? And what's what's happening right here and right now is that a um, invasive species, a very clever one, is now hijacking our own abilities. So at this point in time, right? No, it, it's not. Doesn't seem like a good system, but in in actual fact, it's the perfect system. Uh, and again, this is what my talk is all about. And um, um, I'm going to be focusing on how we we um, we use this system right, to be superheroes. Right? It's a perfect system because it means that if you try and do evil, then that evil is going to come back on you. <laughs> because, you know, in order to um, wish evil on somebody else, you have to focus on evil. So that's what you're going to draw into yourself. So, so if you're someone that is, wants to stop war, you're saying focus on peace. Imagine a peaceful scenario. Focus on peace. Yes. Focus on the, uh, the peaceful resolution to it, you know, um, and then that's what you draw in. But if you say, stop the war, we don't want the war, we don't, you know, stop the fighting. You're going to get war, fighting and, and strife. So if you've got a world of shit in your life, you focus on a scenario where all that is absent and it's gone and, and, you know, you're thriving now. Keep those thoughts in right. mind. Right. You, you would, you would construct a scenario, right. Where, um, of, of what you want to have in the world, how you want to, your life to be. Right. And, and then you, um, um, there's a little bit more to it, but then you fake it until you make it. And then one, one day you'll look around and go, Oh, I'm here. <laughs> right. Because, um, Again, the way this this the fourth dimension works, right, is um, the time aspect. Right, the time is a time aspect is a variable. Right, you it could it could happen happen instantly. It could happen, you know, a year or two down the line. But it will happen. Right, but um, a lot of people get uh, disheartened because it doesn't happen instantly. Because we're we're the instant generation here. We we expect instant results with everything. You know, you switch, uh, turn a light on and and you expect it to light up straight away. You pop a pill and expect to be cured instantly. Right. So, no, you you literally um, 
visualize what it is that you need to have in this world or you know and then and then you start moving towards it as if it's already there right and you know that's your focus don't worry about how it's going to happen because again i, I talk about how it does happen right? but uh, but it will happen in one form or another it will it will occur so that's all going into your new presentation. Are you going to be hitting yeah. the tour circuit with that in the UK? I I am, and um, and also I hope um, to start something called the DreamWorks Club. So um, I want to teach other people to to do this, and at the same time teach myself because um, I only really get stuff if I teach other people. <laughs> so if I fully get it by teaching other people. So. Um, I'm 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 hoping to start this club. Now I initially uh, thought of it as um, people who live near me that we actually physically get together, um, you know, once a month or something, and then go do, you know, set out some exercises and and have a plan to to get to to mastery of this these abilities. Um, but I'm trying to work out a way of um, extending it to people like online. So my first thought about it is that um, get other groups of people um, who will meet um, in their locations and simultaneously, so on a certain day of the month, right, simultaneously all these groups will meet together at the same time and we're all connected maybe via Zoom or something and we all do the same exercises and we all do the same process all at the same time. Okay. Cool. That's the idea. I don't know whether I can get it to work and get get people to do it. Um, you know, all together is another matter. Yeah. So, how can people reach out to you if they want to get involved in your Dave for Leader campaign or uh, the idea you just outlined there? What are the ways of reaching you? Um, right. So, the website that I'm putting together, which uh, is not really in a in a fit, totally finished spot at the moment but it's um daveforleader.co.uk so it's both dave for the number four and leader and dave for leader um dot co dot uk um otherwise it's uh allegedly dave.com and uh, uh on the front page you'll find um um a an article about my 2024 tour and uh, you'll be able to click over to the detail of uh, all the dates and um, how to get in touch with the organisers. Oh, cool. Okay. You're doing a few festivals and conferences and such? Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm still trying to work out and, and juggle the dates. I, I need a PA. <laughs> Me yeah, too. Yeah. A, well, you know, it's a difficult task to try and organise it so you're not bouncing um, from John O'Groats to Land's End, you know, every other day. <laughs> All right, mate. Well, thanks for coming on today. There's plenty for people to mull over there. Uh, yeah. Thanks for bringing your ideas. Yeah, yeah absolutely welcome. And uh, yeah, talk again.